Hey everyone and welcome. Hope everyone's okay. Thank you all for your support and shares. You are helping the channel so much. I appreciate it. Anyway, <laughs> I thought we should take a look at the new Racial Equality Commission and who Boris Johnson has appointed to head such a commission. Before you kick off, wait till the end first. I'm actually happy he's, he's done this and I hope you will agree at the end of the video. The lady who Boris has trusted this to is called Ms. Munira Mirza. I do apologise, Manera, if I've got your names wrong and uh, pronunciation. Who is that, you ask? Well, <laughs> let me tell you. Miss Mercer was a speechwriter for Cameron, now works as advisor and opposition strategist and racial equalities commission head now. Busy lady. She's a mother of one to her husband, Dougie Smith, who is also an advisor and, and opposition strategist for Boris Johnson. The article I found is in the Sun. It's titled "Justice for All: Who Is Munira Mirza and What's Her Role in Boris Johnson's Government?" Boris Johnson has created a new racial equality commission following the global Black Lives Matter protests. The head of the Number Ten Policy Unit. Munira Mirza has been appointed head of the commission to investigate racial and ethnic disparities in British society. Now, I don't want to actually go further into the Sun article. I'd rather find her words, not the words from a journalist. We all know they're all biased. Which leads me to this article in The Spectator from 2017 that she wrote. It's titled, Theresa May's phony race war is dangerous and divisive. Now, this gives us a, a, a bit of an insight into the commission and what it will do even if I don't agree with all of it. Let's read. Next month, Theresa May is expected to launch a long-awaited audit into racial disparities in public services. Now, I know what you're saying. This is from a while ago. It's Theresa May and we've got Boris now, but the, 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 the thought process still applies, does it not? So let's continue to read. We are being prepared for the worst. Unnamed Whitehall insiders say that they have been shocked by the picture it reveals for, of racial discrimination in the UK. All this suggests the scene is being set for another bout of political self-flagellation regarding the subject of race in Britain, in which half-truths are peddled by lobbyists and swallowed wholesale by officialdom. Several studies have already shown that some ethnic groups experience different outcomes in policing, health, employment and education. There are many cases behind causes behind these disparities but the evidence will be carefully selected to suit a predetermined agenda everyone is gearing up for the report to be a game changer because ultimately that is what everyone wants the prime minister is desperate for a d dramatic announcement to tick her burning injustices box and reset her administration for nasty party read nasty country when she announced the audit last august mrs may dropped any pretense that she would wait to see the actual evidence by promising that it would reveal difficult truths her political advisers fondly imagine the audit will somehow improve the Conservative Party's relationship with BAME communities. A panoply of anti-racism lobby groups is excited at the prospect of a new McPherson or Scar McScarman moment that will pave the way for fresh laws and more public funding for them. And the Labour Party sees this as home turf. The more everyone obsesses about race, they believe, the more they stand to gain. Now, I, this is one of the parts that I don't actually agree with. It's not just Labour, this, is it? It's across the board. I mean, we've even got journalists getting involved and, and, and race baiting and mixing it up and, and everything's being seen through a prism of race now, isn't it? But anyway, let's continue. Everyone, including ethnic minorities, should be worried about the way in which anti-racism is becoming weaponised across the political spectrum. It's become we weaponised across every spectrum. What passes for policy is this discussion in this area is now so heavily dis divorced from the facts and driven by ideology that there is, is barely any intelligent debate. Astonishingly, it seems that a lot of people in politics think it's a good idea to ex exaggerate the problem of racism. A telling example of this phenomenon is the David Lammy review into race and the criminal justice system, oh here we go, which was commissioned by government and published last week. Lammy claimed his report clearly shows BAME individuals still face bias, including overt discrimination in parts of the justice system. He pointed to the statistic that BAME men and women make up 14% of the population, but 25% of all prisoners. BAME male prisoners are more than more likely to be in high security prisons, and the odds of a BAME offender receiving a prison sentence for drug offences is higher than for a white than for white offenders. This, he argued, proved the Prime Minister's comment last year: "If you're black, you're." 
were treated more harshly by the criminal justice system than if you're white. Except this is not what the statistics in this report revealed at all. Rather, they showed the Crown Prosecution Service's decision making was broadly proportionate once other factors were taken into account. Jury conviction rates were similar across ethnic groups at between 66 and 68%. In some measures, BAME groups actually had more favourable treatment compared with whites. It is true that in the area of, I won't read that word, and domestic naughtiness, black, uh, black and Chinese and other groups had disproportionate rates of prosecution and the report rightly called for more research into understand why. But if racial bias were a problem throughout the system, one would expect the overall conviction rates to reflect this. By and large, they don't. In fact, the detail of Lamy's report concedes that there are many reasons outside the criminal justice system for the ethnic disparities it describes. Black children are more likely to grow up in a single parent family. Black and mixed ethnic boys are more likely to be permanently excluded from school. And BAME groups have a much higher in incidence of mental illness. All of these are linked to higher rates of offending. In short, there are many social and economic fast factors that go a long way to explain these ethnic disparities. It makes no sense to blame racism or the failings of professionals in the criminal justice system. Differences in racial outcomes are not the same thing as institutional racism, any more than the fact that far more men than women are incarcer incarcerated is evidence of institutional sexism. The most anyone could reasonably say about institutional racism is that the evidence is far from conclusive. Yet virtually no one challenged Lamy's misleading claims. The same wrong-headed thinking about race was at work in another government commission review, Lady McGregor Smith's report into BAME employment, published in February. It made the claim that people from BAME backgrounds are still being held back in a workplace because of the colour of their skin, costing the UK equi economy the equivalent of 1.3% in GDP a year. Most people reading that might reasonably deduce that British businesses were discriminating against BAME people. But as Richard Norrie, a researcher at po Policy Exchange, pointed out at the time, the report paints an unnecessarily bleak picture of ethnic recruitment because it assumes all workplaces should have at least 14% of ethnic minority staff, reflecting the percentage of ethnic minorities in the population. What this ignores is that most, almost half of the non-white population in the UK are immigrants, and many of these have arrived recently with poor communication and low qualifications. It is crazy to insist that they sh have the exact same outcomes as non-BAME groups within only a few years of their arrival. BAME communities also tend to have a younger age profile so it will take years for them to grow and assume positions of responsibility. It would be better to look at how diversity develops over time and whether people from different backgrounds are coming through the talent pipeline which they are in most professions such as law, account accountancy and the civil service. However, in this ideologically driven debate, there are no prizes for pointing out where Britain is doing well and creating opportunities for BAME people. The logical fallacies about race have been taken to ludicrous extremes in the area of mental health. In 2004, John Blowfield, the former High Court judge no less, published an investigation into the death of the black schizophrenic patient David Bennett at the Norvik Clinic in 1998, which concluded that the mental health services were a festering abscess of institutional racism. In 2005, the government produced a new action plan for the sector to reduce disproportionate admissions of black patients to psychiatric wards, a policy which has been continued by successive governments, including the present one. But the reality is that incidence of mental health illness is objectively much higher in the BAME population. Professor Swaran Singh, a social and community psychiatrist with more than 30 years of clinical experience, has argued for over a decade that institutional racism in his profession is not the cause of this. Academic studies show that BAME and migrant groups are more exposed to mental health risk factors factors, including family breakdown, substance abuse, poverty, living in areas with low social cohesion and of course the personal experience of migration and prior instances of racial prejudice. Afro-Caribbean people are more likely than whites to be diagnosed with mental illness, sectioned, forcibly restrained and placed in seclusion. They also make up a third of inpatients on medium secure psychi psychiatric wards. For a psychiatrist to turn away patients or amend their treatment because of some government target would be frankly irresponsible. We have now reached a point where all differences in public service outcomes by race are assumed somehow to be the result of institutional racism. The Macpherson report in 1999 into the police laid 
the ground for this new orthodoxy, positing that racism exists all around us in the system and that it is perpetuated unwillingly by people working within it. Rather than judging by objective criteria, it handed down the unusual instruction to measure racism according to people's subjective perceptions. If one believes something to be racist, then officially it is. Now, I'm not talking much in, in between this, everyone. I, I don't want to, to break it up, to be honest. I just want to read out her opinion, and then I'll, I'll give you my opinion at the end, and uh, we'll, we'll have a discussion. Paradoxically, just at the point when racist attitudes were declining in society and many ethnic groups were integrating successfully, our political leaders became obsessed with racism. The last decade in particular has seen a range of measures, from diversity training to ethnic targets aimed at combating the widespread racism that supposedly pollutes society I object to that I'm, I, I'm, I'm not racist as, as you guys know I don't know anyone anyone that is to be honest the last decade in, I've done that the tragedy is that accusations of institutional racism and their official endorsement have corroded BAME communities trust in public services thereby making things worse Singh found in his 2006 research into mental health services that the call to fight racism in mental health was creating a self self fulfilling prophecy where bla whereby black patients seek help only in a crisis disengage from services prematurely and have repeated admissions with poor out patients and their families were so convinced that they would be locked up and harmed by their doctors that they were even conf refusing to take medication often it was that when they had already caused or were on the verge of causing harm to themselves or others that they first came to the attention of the authorities, at which point more forcible means were required to protect them. Hidden in Lamy's review was a similarly telling discovery. One of the reasons why black people are more likely to receive harsher sentences in, in the courts is that they do not trust their solicitor's advice to plead guilty, meaning that they do not benefit from more lenient sentencing. Believing the accusation of institutional racism, BAME communities are afraid to trust their own lawyers and end up making decisions that harm their chances in the system. Some of this lack of trust must be attribu attri attributable to the historic legacy of racism from a previous area, era. But it is at the very least possible that much of it is also driven by the current accusation of racism. His report will do nothing to improve that and will probably make it worse. To shift this in the way we think about racism has also had a wider cultural effect. A generation of young Bane people believe that they are disadvantaged because of their race and they are angry. They are told repeatedly about how racist universities are, especially Oxbridge, how racist their schools are, how racist employers are, how racist the police are and so on. Ad infinitum. In pretty much all these areas, the statistics tell a more complex story about poverty, class, cultural norms and expectations. In many areas, such as university, entry or recruitment into the professions, a number of ethnic groups are actually doing better than white British people. David Cameron even once cl claimed that a young black, ma black man was more likely to be in prison than university, which was factually completely untrue, as this publication li later pointed out. But imagine the message that sent out to thousands of hopeful parents who had come to this country with dreams for the children. Anyone who delves into the facts, however, is warned off by the prospect of a moral punishment beating. I am no longer engaging with white people on the topic of race, writes Rini Edo Lodge. Same again. I'm terrible at names, I really am. A black British author in a recent published polemic not all white people just the vast majority who refuse to accept the existence of structural racism and its symptoms their intent intent is not, often not to listen or learn but to exert their power to prove me wrong to emotionally drain me and to rebalance the status quo ed Lodge, like so many of the younger generation of anti-racist activists is not interested in hearing people disagree with her this is essentially demanding an uncritical reception for contentious political ideas on the grounds that it hurts too much to listen when trevor phillips the then head of the equality and human rights commission dared to say that institutional racism was no longer relevant in terms of, of britain he was widely denounced. Not long afterwards, several members of the board resigned. By appeasing the anti-racism lobby and affirming its culture of grievance, public institutions and business leaders are not making Britain a fairer place. In fact, they are harming the very people they aspire to help. 
by importing into the UK the diverse, the divisive politics of anti-racism from America, with it demented campus dramas and the neurosis about safe places, safe spaces, microaggressions and cultural appropriation, they make it almost impossible for people of goodwill of all ethnicities to rub along together. May and her ministers may lack the courage to halt the bandwagon, but there is cause for hope in the growing number of young people from ethnic minority backgrounds who can see through the divisive politics of anti-racism. Not so much now though, eh? Their lived experience gives the lie to the idea of Britain as a fundamentally racist society. It is possible to acknowledge that racism still exists without turning its waning influence into the pretext for a bogus moral crusade that pollutes the public space with false accusations based on selective evidence. Despite the inevitable challenges of integrating millions of newcomers, Britain is a country that is conspicuously f fair and tolerant by any reasonable standard. We have earned the right to focus on the positive. For the Prime Minister to claim that we have a serious problem with racism really would be a burning injustice. I know, I know, it is long and in depth. Now what's my opinion? I do not believe this is black versus white. I believe it's being shown like that for an agenda. And of course, the race baiters were out in force crying. First up we've got Ash Mustache. She is a dreadful appointment to lead a commission into racial inequality, but a smart pick for Johnson. Why? 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 Because she's a racial gatekeeper, a person of colour who gives political cover to ongoing injustice. So that this woman believes her opinion is more important and therefore anyone else that has a differing opinion is only there as cover. Who's the racist, Ash? And delegitimises years of study and community struggle. Then we've got Dr Shola Moss Shogbamimu Would Boris Johnson put Holocaust denier to lead co commission on anti-Semitism? No. Why is Mira Mirza to lead another review on systemic racism when she denies it a denies against black people? Denies against black people. No, she denies that systemic racism even exists. That's what she denies. And you don't like it, do you? Why is that? And I'll tell you exactly why that is, because your entire career is built on the fact that this country is racist. Is it not? Have you seen this woman on the TV? Absolute disgrace. Racist Boris picks another brown executioner to de delegitimise, discredit and deny. Wow. Then next up we've got The Guardian. Let's see what these have to say. This may over advisor chosen to set up UK Race Inequality Commission. Mizra has, Mirza has doubted existence of institutional racism and criticises culture of grievance. As do we all. <laughs> you saw the David Limey one earlier. And then we've got the last one is from Const Konstantin Kissin, who's the British-Russian comedian from Trigonometry. Now, there is actually an interview with Mirza on their channel, so go and check it out, everyone. But Konstantin said... She understands that facts matter in solving problems. That's why they don't want her there. The woke left does not care about diversity. All they want is power and black, brown and other minority people who think for themselves are enemies in their eyes. And by the tweets we read previously, tends to bear that out, doesn't it? I de defy anyone to watch our interview and not be impressed by her analysis and her as a person. Ignore the helicopter. Don't know what that means. <laughs> but go and check it out, everyone. I will leave a, a link in the description for you. Personally, I follow Martin Luther King. I didn't know it at the time, but I was actually brought up shoulder to shoulder and colour blind. What was the speech? Content of character. And I am a firm believer in that. I hope we get identity politics destroyed. Groupthink, in my opinion, is playing us against each other. It's making us tribal, and that is never going to end well. I do believe we should have discussions about this, but ID politics and racism accusations have totally, and I mean this, totally destroyed dialogue. Adult dialogue, I should say. How do we fix this without more hurt? We talk. No more cancel culture, no more st statues being ripped down, no more opinions being removed, even if you don't like them, no more re changing of language to fit your narratives, none of that sort of stuff. 
we may be able to sort this out then. But, and I have a big but in this regard, I do not believe in institutional racism, perceived racism, white privilege, systemic racism in the UK. I don't think it applies here. In the USA, I've never been there. I'm not even going to entertain my opinion on that. I have no right in, my, in regards to that. Like I said earlier, have nots get it in the neck a lot more than the haves do. And that's what I think this is. It's the haves and the have nots. They're playing us against each other. In my opinion, it's got nothing to do with race, but let's see what the commission says. I'm hoping that it will actually have a look more, at more in depth without the fear of being called racist. We understand what that's all about, don't we? The only racist I can see at the moment seems to be coming from the left. But what say you? Let me know what your opinions are on this one, everyone. I'd like to know. I'd like to get discussion going. In regards to the video, that is the end. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, don't forget to hit the like button. If you're new, don't forget to share it. Subscribe. Hit the bell icon. Stay safe, everyone. And I'll see you on the next one.